I'm here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon. And the Angelus bells are ringing. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amene Patris et Filius Spiritus Sancti. Amen. I'm here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon, and today is the eighth day in our Epiphany Novena. It's a quick break in the clouds, a quick break from rain, so I hope I can get this filmed before it starts raining again. We proceed to the eighth article of uh, the Summa, St. Thomas Aquinas, part three, question 36, article eight. And the question being, whether it was becoming that the Magi should come to adore Christ and pay homage to him. Objection number one. It would seem that it was unbecoming that the Magi should come to adore Christ and pay homage to him, for reverence is due to a king from his subjects. But the Magi did not belong to the kingdom of the Jews. Therefore, since they knew by seeing the star that he was born that he that was born was the king of the Jews, it seems unbecoming that they should come to adore him. Objection number two. Further, it seems absurd during the reign of one king to proclaim a stranger. But in Judea, Herod was reigning. Therefore, it was foolish of the Magi to proclaim the birth of a king. Objection number three. Further, a heavenly sign is more certain than a human sign. But the Magi had come to Judea from the east under the guidance of a heavenly sign. Therefore it was foolish of them to seek human guidance besides that of the star, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Objection number four. Further, the offering of gifts and the homage of adoration are not due save to kings already reigning. But the Magi did not find Christ resplendent with kingly grandeur. Therefore, it was unbecoming for them to offer him gifts and homage. And on the contrary, <clears throat> it is written in Isaiah uh, chapter 60, verse 3, The Gentiles shall walk in the light, and kings in the brightness of thy rising. But those who walk in the divine light do not err. Therefore, the Magi were right in offering homage to Christ. Now, let's see what, how St. Thomas answers this. I answer that, as stated above, the Magi are the first fruits of the Gentiles that believed in Christ, because their faith was a presage of the faith and devotion of the nations who were to come to Christ from afar. And therefore, as the devotion and faith of the nations is without any error through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, so also we must believe that the Magi, inspired by the Holy Ghost, did wisely in paying homage to Christ. Now, reply to objection number one. And let's take a look at objection number one again. It would seem that it was unbecoming that the Magi should come to adore Christ and pay homage to him, for reverence is due to a king from his subjects, but the Magi did not belong to the kingdom of the Jews, Therefore, and since they knew by seeing the star that he was born, that he that was born was the king of the Jews, it seems unbecoming that they should come to adore him. And the, the reply to that objection one, as Augustine says in a sermon on the Epiphany, though many kings of the Jews had been born and died, none of them did the Magi seek to adore. 
And so they who came from a distant foreign land to a kingdom that was entirely strange to them had no idea of showing such great homage to such a king as, as the Jews were wont to have. But they had learnt that such a king was born, that by adoring him they might be sure of obtaining from him the salvation which is of God. And the reply to objection two. So let's take a look at objection two again. Further, it seems absurd during the reign of one king to proclaim a stranger. But in Judea, Herod was reigning. Therefore, it was foolish of the Magi to proclaim the birth of a king. And the reply then to objection two. By proclaiming Christ king, the Magi foreshadowed the constancy of the Gentiles in confessing Christ even until death. Whence Chrysostom says in his second homily on Matthew that while they thought of the king who was to come, the Magi feared not the king who was actually present. They had not yet seen Christ, and they were already prepared to die for him. And the reply to objection three. Let's take a look at objection three again. Further, a heavenly sign is more certain than a human sign. But the Magi had come to Judea from the east under the guidance of a heavenly sign. Therefore it was foolish of them to seek human guidance besides that of the star, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And then the reply to objection three, as Augustine says in his sermon on the Epiphany, the star which led the Magi to the place where the divine infant was with his virgin mother could bring them to the town of Bethlehem, in which Christ was born. Yet it hid itself until the Jews also bore testimony of the city in which Christ was to be born. So that being encouraged by a twofold witness, as Pope Leo says in his Sermon 34, they might seek with more ardent faith him whom both the brightness of the star and the authority of prophecy revealed. Thus they proclaim that Christ is born and inquire where. They believe and ask, as it were, betokening those who walk by faith and desire to see, as Augustine says in a sermon on the Epiphany. Uh, sermon number looks like 90... Oh, I can't quite figure that out. 90... <laughs> uh, no, wait. 190... 199. Um, okay. But the Jews, by indicating to them the place of Christ's birth, are like the carpenters who built the Ark of Noah, who provided others with the means of escape, and themselves perished in the flood. Those who asked heard and went their way. The teachers spoke and stayed where they were like the milestones that point out the way, but walk not. So says Augustine in another sermon. It was also by God's will that when they no longer saw the star, the Magi by human instinct went to Jerusalem to seek in the royal city the newborn king, in order that Christ's birth might be publicly proclaimed first in Jerusalem, according to Isaiah 2, 3, the law shall come forth from Sion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And also, in order, and also, in order that by the seal of the Magi who came from afar, the indolence of the Jews who lived near at hand might be proved worthy of condemnation. So writes Remigius in his homily on Matthew, number two, verse one. Now, the reply to objection four, and let us recall objection four. Further, the offering of gifts and the homage of adoration are not due, save to kings already reigning, but the Magi did not find Christ resplendent with kingly grandeur. Therefore, it was unbecoming for them to offer him gifts and homage. And the reply to objection four, as Christosom says in homily two on Matthew, if the Magi had come in search of an earthly king, they would have been disconcerted at finding that they had taken the trouble to come such a long way for nothing. Consequently, they would have neither adored nor offered gifts. But since they sought a heavenly king, though they found in him no signs of royal preeminence, yet content with the testimony of the star alone, they adored. For they saw a man, and they acknowledged a god. Moreover, they offer gifts in keeping with Christ's greatness, gold as to the great king. They offer up incense as to God, 
because it is used in the divine sacrifice, and myrrh, which is used in embalming the bodies of the dead, is offered to him, is offered as to him who is to die for the salvation of all. So writes Gregory in his homily, in his tenth homily on the gospel. And hereby, as Gregory says, from the same, from the same source, we are taught to offer gold, which signifies wisdom, to the newborn king by the luster of our wisdom in his sight. We offer God incense, which signifies fervor in prayer, if our constant prayers mount up to God with an odor of sweetness. And we offer myrrh, which signifies mortification of the flesh, if we mortify the ill deeds of the flesh by refraining from them. And there we have the eighth and last article on the manifestation of the child, Jesus. Well, we have one more day in our novena, day number nine, and we will turn from St. Thomas to, well, you'll have to watch the ninth video to find out what our reflection will be on tomorrow. Well, let us now head inside for our novena prayer, and you can click on the link in the description below the video for a printout of the novena prayer, and also for a video uh, if you would like to pray along with me inside the church at the nativity scene. Otherwise, please join me tomorrow for the ninth and last day of this novena here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon, and don't miss a day of prayer with us.